Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SMC Journal podcast. This is the show that's all about systems engineering, software engineering, DevOps, performance, observability, and much more in today's modern enterprise IT. I'm Scott Moore, your host. Thank you for being with us today. So EBPF, you just can't get away from it. And it's not anything new, but it's something that's being talked about a lot more now that Kubernetes has taken hold of the being the cloud operating system. So today, I actually want to talk to a company who's right in the middle of all that and how it, uh, how their product is actually helping us as performance engineers get a better Kubernetes experience. Before we do that, though, let's talk about the sponsor that make this podcast happen, and that is MicroFocus. MicroFocus is the maker of LoadRunner Professional Enterprise Cloud and Developer, that whole LoadRunner family. If you'll scan that QR code, it will take you to a page where you'll learn more about LoadRunner and how you can download the Community Edition with free 50 virtual users across multiple protocols, all those monitors, and you can check out the uh, LoadRunner videos on YouTube as well. Uh, I've been using LoadRunner for decades now, and one of the things that separates that product from others is their great protocol listing that is probably far beyond any other load testing tool out there, and they're continuing to put out more protocols to support you in the enterprise who are load testing much more than just web. The other thing is they take that combined with monitors real time while you're running a load test, and then an analysis engine where you can really cross all these results together so that you can pinpoint exactly where a bottleneck is when you're running a load test. So check out MicroFocus's LoadRunner product today. Tell them Scott Moore sent you. EBPF, the first thing that you should probably know, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, um, this is not anything new, the Berkeley Packet Filter, EBPF, the BPF is Berkeley Packet Filter, uh, we don't have to go any further than our friend at Wikipedia to tell us what the Berkeley Packet Filter is, you should probably read this page, but you, if you have done anything in software engineering in the past 20 years, you've probably ran something like TCP dump to look at a a dump of what's happening on TCP IP on the wire, like you're on a Unix machine or even Windows, uh, Wireshark, if you've used any of that, that TCP dump, that's where it's coming from is this Berkeley packet filter. And the E is the extended Berkeley packet filter. And the one of the originators of that is a guy named Brendan Gregg. So here is, if you get nothing else out of this show, is Scott Moore's advice for you as a brand new performance engineer, or you're just dipping your toes in the water, find out about Brendan Gregg and how awesome he is and his contributions to performance in this space. Here's a page to brendangregg.com where you can see a lot of the documentation that he's written, blog articles where he talks about how to use uh, eBPF, all about flame graphs and all these really cool things that we're using today in performance testing and engineering and and, and all around. So Brendan Gregg is awesome. He's got a couple of books out there. I've got them. I've started reading some of them. Some of them I don't even understand. I'm going to have to read two or three times because some of the stuff just whoop because I'm just not that deep all the time. EBPF, it's gone mainstream because of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is able to utilize this maybe uh, maybe more effectively than some of the other implementations of software than we've had in the past. So today's guest is Bill Mulligan of Isovalent, and Cilium is the product that Isovalent makes. This slide talks about how you've got this upper stack listed there, and that is all the stuff that's going on in Kubernetes, the services, the control plane, all of that stuff that's happening. And, and there's a lot of it. There's a lot of things that have to happen within Kubernetes to control pods and clusters. And some of the stuff is inherited from technologies that have been used since the 80s. We'll just put it frankly, we're, we're trying to continue to use methods and technology that was made for a different time and some of that stuff is going to have to be changed so Cilium basically goes around a lot of that um, by introducing sort of another uh, underlying layer and is able to bring you closer to some of the performance that you would expect out of a native host of Kubernetes instead of just like with inside the pod after it's been translated two or three times by some other uh, filter or technology. 
So this is just one way that psyllium is being used by taking their own way of queuing, becoming sort of like an MQ, uh, rabbit MQ inside of Kubernetes to control packet scheduling. And they have seen some amazing results from this. If you compare Cilium's implementation versus the traditional implementation, um, you can actually see they get a 4.2x better latency. And anytime you can reduce latency on requests and responses, um, that is going to be a huge win. You can also see where they get a transaction rate that is 6.8 times better, which I think is, is pretty awesome. So what is this EDT and TBF? TBF? Uh, basically, if you look at the way that uh, things have been queued up in the past, it was made for, like I said, a different time. Google started talking about something called early departure time, earliest departure time, where they basically have a bucket of these tokens and they say, you can't take off. I mean, they're controlling it like, uh, I guess, airport traffic control have a bucket of tokens you can take off if you've got a token once the tokens are out temporarily you got to be put on hold and then when you get more tokens in this bucket there's a long explanation about this in the kubecon eu presentation and i'm probably getting it halfway wrong but the bottom line is it's a different way of scheduling this traffic there's also some other TCP IP changes that Google has been talking about for a few years. Uh, one of them I'll mention is, is BBR. You can look that up. I think we're going to have a, another show uh, just about that if we can. Um, but that kind of brings me to my guest today to talk about Cilium in general. And that, that's, that's just one of the things that they do. But I, I want to talk about more than that. So let's bring on Bill Mulligan. I'm going to let him talk about some of the things that Cilium does for us performance engineers that will make you smile. Hey, Bill, thanks for being on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. So I want to ask you some questions about isovalent, Cilium, and eBPF, because that's the really the topic of this show is, is Cilium. I was watching some videos out there from KubeCon and some earlier conferences about how Cilium makes Kubernetes perform better in multiple different ways. And of course, as a performance engineer, that really interests me. So before I ask those questions, I want you to establish like, who are you and what about this, the, the company, Isovalent and Cilium? What is all of this? Yeah, so I'm Bill Mulligan. I work at Isovalent and my role there is to help grow and build the communities around eBPF and Cilium and make them as successful as possible. A big part of that is telling the story about why eBPF uh, and Cilium are making the whole cloud native world more performant, um, more secure and more scalable. So tell me, you got the shirt on eBPF. Can you tell our audience why eBPF is sort of a game changer? Yeah, definitely. So eBPF is actually in some ways quite an old technology. It has its roots in the Berkeley packet filter, and that is a decades old technology. As we were trying to, I guess, kind of like scale up systems, make them more performant, that like Berkeley packet filter has been extended. So extended Berkeley packet filter to encompass more things. And what eBPF allows you to do is to make the Linux kernel programmable. So be able to add new features and functionalities in a dynamic way, similar to when JavaScript came to the web. All of a sudden, instead of having just static web pages, you could add feature and functionalities on demand based on how the user was interacting with the website. eBPF allows you to do the exact same thing, except for in the kernel context. In addition to that, it allows you to do it in a secure and performant manner because obviously the kernel is a very important space in computing and you don't want to mess that up and crash the kernel. As soon as you start saying kernel, security people start getting nervous. Yeah. <laughs> so with, with Cilium, I, I was noticing um, there's a lot of stuff in Kubernetes. It's just going on in Kubernetes, management, administration, overhead. And it seems like with Cilium, you've sort of cut through a lot of that red tape and saying, why do we need all of these things? Why can we not kind of bypass this and make it better? Can you talk a little bit about what Cilium does to, to kind of streamline what's going on with Kubernetes? Yeah, definitely. So 
a lot of what Kubernetes is leveraging, things like uh, IP tables, are built for kind of like a different era of computing. They're not built for uh, things with, you know, 10,000 node clusters and uh, hundreds of thousands of pods. And so the question then is, how do you make Linux kernel more programmable and more performant for use cases like that? And in the world of distributing computing, uh, Cilium leverages eBPF to provide that. So it can replace things like IP tables and use eBPF routing to make the routing within the cluster more scalable and more performant. So I just noticed that there was a new blog article out on the Cilium.io website about a performance test that was recently done at a company showing how much more improvement they're seeing by using Cilium. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? how that came about? Yeah, definitely. So Hetzner is a cloud provider based in Germany. They were looking to update their ingress capabilities for like the modern cloud native world. And when they were evaluating their different options, um, Cilium came out on top because of its ability to be Kubernetes native and also leveraging eBPF for performance. And they wanted to test it out in different configurations that their customers would use in the real world. And the results of their tests resulted in uh, like performance, like requests per second that were 20 to hundred percent better. They reduced latency from 30 to 60%. Um, and they reduced the CPU usage by around 50% too. Um, in another similar article, uh, Cilium also has a layer four load balancer and there's an internet provider in the Czech Republic. And when they were doing performance testing, um, switching from an IPVS based load balancer to the Cilium layer four load balancer, um, they actually thought they broke the system uh, because the CPU usage went down 72 X and basically just disappeared. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. Uh, and you know, sometimes it's not just CPU power that you're lacking. It's the latency that really gets you. So by reducing that, that's, that's amazing. So really you're able to, uh, by cutting, a lot of this overhead, you're you're getting performance as close to the native host as possible. And I think that's that's a big deal. Let's talk a little bit about what eBPF and Cilium is able to give us in terms of observability, because that's the next question is, okay, maybe we're doing performance testing, but what are we looking at that tells us this is so much better other other than your traditional infrastructure, you know, CPU memory, whatever? Uh, what what observability metrics would we see coming out of Cilium? Yeah, so the interesting thing about eBPF versus other um, observability tools is that it's based in the kernel. Um, it sees everything that's going on in the kernel. And so what it allows you to do is to closely track whatever metric that you want to, whether that's read, write, throughput, um, those type of things. And you're able to pull out that really granular data and analyze it in a way. Um, and so Cilium has a related tool called Hubble that provides that network observability on the it, with the kernel context that most other tools can't provide you. And you are able to push this out to like Grafana if we wanted to create our own custom graphs around that and things like that. Um, is that is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So there is recently announced an integration between Cilium and Grafana where you can take that great eBPF um, observability data and push it into Grafana for the great visual visualizations. So if somebody wanted to jump in and start actually using this and they're currently deploying Kubernetes applications, um, where's the easiest place to get started? Yeah, so if you go to Cilium.io um, or docs.cilium.io, you can find the docs and there's getting started guides for basically any type of Kubernetes installation that you want from uh, something local like Kind all the way up to any of the managed uh, cloud providers. Um, Cilium's also the default for uh, every single major cloud provider. Um, so if you are spinning up a cluster right now in the cloud, you're most likely already using Cilium. We'll make sure that we include those links that you mentioned on the show notes. Uh, just one other question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where the vision is for Cilium? Like, where do you think this, this is going? Like what's, what's next on the horizon, new features or, or what have you? Yeah, definitely. So a thing that was launched, uh, last year was the Cilium service mesh. Um, so service mesh has kind of been a hot topic in the cloud native world for a while. Con connectivity and security story at the layer seven world, which is really important in distributed computing. Um, now Cilium is 
But that's kind of going from layer seven. I, uh, the additional context that Cilium gives you is that it's working at layer three and layer four, and we're adding on the additional features. So you'll, with Cilium Service Mesh, you're able to understand, connect, and secure your applications from layer three all the way to layer seven, all in one place. Wow, sounds exciting. Definitely going to be following after this uh, this product right here because I think uh, we're gonna we're gonna hear a lot more from you guys. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today, and we'll make sure that uh, we have you back on anytime you want to discuss something new. Make sure you contact us, and we'll have you on. Yeah, thanks. It was fun to be here. All right, I know that other podcasters have had special um, shows about Cilium. And one of them is my buddy Henrik Rexid on Is It Observable? And so I'll make sure that I include his episode about eBPF and Cilium as well. Um, this is a really cool technology and we definitely want to keep track of it. I'd like to know what you think about it. So why don't you contact me? There's several ways that you can do so. I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and other places. If you'll just scan that QR code, it'll take you to my bio of links that you can easily get to me. And I'm pretty easy to find on social media always always chit chatting and talking. You can also email me at my new email address, which is Hey Scott at smcjournal.com. I'm also available at scottmore.consulting. That is my website, no.com, no.net. And it would be great if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel, scan that QR code or go to that URL and subscribe because that really helps me make sure that I am delivering the kind of content that you want to see. And I want you to be notified when I put out a new show. So with that, I'd like to get your feedback about isovalent, psyllium, and what other kind of topics you'd like for me to cover on the show. Until next time, this is Scott Moore for the SMC Journal saying thank you and bye-bye.